All right, do you want to take a look here at the uh, question one FRQ from the 2019 uh, macro exam? Um, as you're getting familiar with uh, all of these uh, formats, right? So uh, standard format gives you uh, a little bit longer time uh, to budget on this is question number one, which is usually multi-part uh, and really is, is a number of different questions uh, from the same scenario. So uh, you want to be sure to, to, to carefully uh, spend some time reading through. Um, and as with most questions, right, it's a, a matter of uh, determining what they're actually asking for in the first place uh, and then successfully uh, uh, figuring it out. So uh, I'm going to try to go through this question here. Um, hopefully this won't take too long to uh, explain through. A lot of this part, uh, a lot of this question is straightforward. Um, so we've got Canada is an open economy that is currently in a recessionary output gap. All right, so part A, uh, they want you to draw a correctly labeled graph. Uh, and they got all these things here, right? So, you know, if you so happen to forget uh, what graph you got to draw here, right? They give you a huge clue. Uh, and tell you all the sort of parts of it, right? Everything that you should uh, include. Um, and be sure with any time you're drawing a graph, one, you gotta have the right graph, but make sure you label. Um, so if you, if you read this again, right, what are they asking you to draw? Uh, so they're asking you to draw the uh, recessionary gap uh, graph from the ADAS model. So let me... Toggle over the whiteboard here. Um, so let's do, this is part A uh, from the question we're looking at, right? So uh, the ADAS model, if you remember, let's just draw it nice and big here, a little minimal eraser. Um, so we have PL over here, right? Which stands for, let's just be sure we put everything in, price level. Uh, over here, we're going to have, instead of quantity, right, we have real GDP. This was from our ADAS model. Um, it's a quantity, just a particular quantity, real GDP. Um, okay. If you remember, we had short run aggregate supply curve, and we had uh, AD. Let's just, uh, for now, because we're going to have a shift in this graph later in, in another part of the question, um, be sure to uh, label those um, as one. Okay, so, um, so in, in this particular question, they wanted you to label uh, the quantities very particularly. Um, so the actual output we're at is Y1. Let's just pull this over right now while we're here. Uh, PL1. Um, now, if you remember, the key uh, to these graphs, the ADAS model, is, is where the intersection is in, in uh, relationship to the long run aggregate supply curve. Um, so, a, a market in uh, long term equilibrium, uh, this intersection would be uh, with the uh, long run aggregate supply curve. Um, this graph, particular graph, asks us to draw a, a recessionary gap, right? So the LRAS should be somewhere. Oops. That's the long run aggregate supply curve there. Uh, should be somewhere off here to the right of this intersection over here. Um, if they ask you to draw, uh, draw an inflationary gap, right, um, it would be flipped, right? The intersection would be somewhere off here to the right and the long run aggregate supply curve would be to the left. So, um, and then there was another thing you had to draw. Uh, they wanted you to label this particularly as uh, Y sub F standing for uh, real output uh, of real GDP at full employment, right? Remember if we're on the long run aggregate supply curve, uh, that means we're utilizing all our uh, resources in the economy uh, and we are at uh, full employment, right? Um, so if uh, they didn't ask you in this particular question. So this should be uh, a correct graph for part uh, A. Um, if they were to ask you, what's the recessionary gap, right? It's the difference between uh, Y sub F, right? Y at full employment uh, versus Y sub one where we're actually at right now. That's our, our current equilibrium. Um, I'm gonna use the same graph because 
Uh, part B, uh, they ask you to, uh, I believe they ask you to describe, uh, but then also show on the same graph uh, what will happen. So um, I don't have it up right now. Let's see, let's see if we can toggle back. All right, so part B. Um, so we have all our things labeled here. This should be uh, full credit for part A. Part B, uh, central bank and government do not take any policy actions to close the output gap. Now, I remember in the classical model, right, uh, given enough time, and right, and then the long run is not a defined uh, amount of time. Uh, it's just a, sort of a theoretical uh, uh, time frame of thinking. Um, but if the government doesn't do anything, uh, remember the government, uh, sorry, the government, the economy uh, would tend to uh, gravitate towards full employment. Um, let's see, let me go back here. So what will happen in the long run? So uh, given enough time, remember Keynes said, you know, well, in the long run, we're all dead. Uh, the recessionary gap will cause uh, prices uh, to decrease. So think about uh, wages, right? Think about input costs. Uh, these are all going to uh, decrease uh, given enough time, right? And what that does, uh, if your input costs um, uh, are decreasing, is eventually it will shift your, your um, and what is this, the SRAS2, right? Uh, shift your short run aggregate supply curve uh, to the right, uh, gradually over time, uh, closing this gap, okay? So we end up back on the long run aggregate supply curve. Uh, and then if you wanted to, for good measure, you could uh, label this as price level two. And you can see how, you don't have to write that in there because they didn't ask you about it, but you see our recessionary gap uh, is a very deflationary thing, right? Uh, uh, causes downward pressure on price levels um, and can be a very painful thing, right? So uh, no, given no government intervention, uh, that's what's gonna happen there um, in part B. So let us go back. So let's go to part C. Uh, now we're gonna talk about some government interventions, right? So let's read through this. Suppose the Canadian government is unwilling to wait for the long run adjustment process, right? That can take a long time. Uh, they give you the MPC, marginal propensity to consume is 0 0.8. The equilibrium real output uh, is $500 billion. Okay, so this was our Y sub one on this graph. Uh, and the, they give you the full employment output, that's the uh, Y sub F as 540 billion. Um, so this is worded in a somewhat confusing way as to, to what they're asking for, but let's let's go through this, right? So um, they're going to ask you uh, two separate questions. One, uh, calculate the minimum change uh, and indicate the direction of change in government spending uh, required to shift the aggregate demand curve. So let's um, they're gonna do two things here. One, first one's going to ask about government spending. That's the G component, right, in aggregate demand. Um, and then there's part two here. Uh, is going to ask about a change in taxes. So that's going to get, the, the first one is going to be a, a spending multiplier question. Um, and then the second one is going to be a tax multiplier question. So it's a little bit tricky. I think the tax multiplier one is a little trickier. Um, but and it's worded in a way that's not sure exactly what they're they're asking. But, you know, the, the, the clue here, I think, is uh, when they give you the marginal propensity to consume, um, that should be a clue in your mind to, uh, oh, hey, I, you know, I remember spending multiplier uh, probably going to have to calculate that in some way uh, and figure out what we're doing. So let's um, let's go back to our graph. Um, so they all of a sudden give you numbers here, right? Now we don't need the graph anymore for this question, uh, but you do have to realize um, over here they said this is 540 billion, uh, and we're currently at 500 billion, right? So what they want to do. Um, is shift aggregate demand right back up here so that we can get back on the long run air supply curve uh, without this painful uh, move down here in, in, in prices. Um, so you need to know that we need to increase, ultimately increase Y, right, our output, our real GDP by this difference here, right? 540 minus 500 uh, is $40 billion. So let's go back real quick. Um, okay, so in part one, we need the minimum change uh, and then indicate the direction of change in government spending 
So obviously this is gonna be a positive number, right? We wanna impact our, our why, our, our real output. So we wanna increase uh, government spending, the G component. And then the question is, well, how much do we need to increase it uh, to move final output from 500 billion to uh, 540? So that's, that's uh, rephrasing the question there. Um, let's see, can I erase all this? I'd erase it all very easily. Give me a minute. Okay. All right. I got a clear screen there. Um, okay. So we needed to get. Our, our Y, our, our GDP, right, is currently at 500, uh, but we need to get it up to 540, and this is, these are billion dollar figures. Uh, so we need to increase by 40 billion. All right, now the first question was, it was simple, right? How much G, uh, or how much do we need to increase the G, uh, government spending, uh, in order to get a final effect of this $40 billion? So, uh, they gave us the uh, MPC, right? Marginal propensity to consume in this case is 0 0.8. So uh, if you remember, right, the uh, spending multiplier. Formula is, uh, so let's say equal to NPC, sorry. So what that equals in this case, uh, one minus or one over one minus uh, 0 0.8. So we end up with one over 0 0.2 uh, and this is equal to five. So what does that mean again? Uh, spending multiplier is going to, uh, you know, because uh, spending, all spending becomes somebody else's income uh, and then they turn around, right, and, and spend, uh, you know, let's say I spend a dollar, right? Uh, then whoever I give that to is going to turn around and, and spend 80 cents of that uh, and so on and so forth, right? So it's one of those uh, infinite series. Um, and this is how you calculate sort of the ultimate effect of that. So what we know now is that whatever the government spends, whatever that G number is we're looking for. Um, so that's what we're looking for, right? Uh, let's just call it G. Uh, we don't know what that should be. G times the spending multiplier is gonna equal what? Well, it's the amount we want to increase GDP. Uh, and that's this 40 billion uh, uh, figure up here. So uh, you do the algebra, right? G equals 40 over five. So your answer for this question, this part of this question uh, is $8 billion. So if government spends, uh, increases their spending by $8 billion uh, to get the ultimate effect on GDP, uh, you got to multiply that spending by the spending multiplier, which we calculated over here, right? So that's five. Uh, so you check your answer there, right? Eight times five. Uh, all right, we're going to get $40 billion. So in theory, our, we've increased uh, our GDP back to that uh, Y sub F, that full employment. Um, so that's part one uh, of that question. Again, fairly straightforward. Now, I think part two is a little bit more difficult. Uh, the tax multiplier is a little bit more difficult to, uh, uh, to think about. Um, although it does have a, a formula that you can uh, memorize. Oops. All right, so let's just go back. We'll leave all that up. Um, so now they're phrasing this question as uh, how much, um, and again, this is a positive 8 billion, right? We need to increase uh, government spending. So again, they want direction. So uh, if we need to um, close this gap, right? We need to stimulate aggregate demand. Um, in terms of taxes, what are we going to do? Well, we know uh, intuitively we're not going to raise taxes, right? That's less money in consumers' pockets. They're going to spend less money. Um, so we should know intuitively that this is going to be a tax cut uh, if we're trying to uh, stimulate demand. So that should take care of, of direction. Um, but how do you calculate the tax multiplier? Uh, 
Um, and so let's go down here. All right, tax multiplier is equal to the MPC over MPS. So in this case, we have 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.2, right? Uh, the MPS is going to be 1 minus the MPC because they're going to both add up to 1. Uh, in this case, it's going to be 4. So this is the tax multiplier. So again, in the same way, the spending multiplier, this is uh, what effect will taxes have, uh, a tax cut or a tax raise uh, for that matter, uh, on uh, ultimate uh, spending and GDP. Now, why would it be less than uh, the spending multiplier? Well, it makes sense if you think about it, right? So um, let's say there's a, a tax cut, right? So uh, taxes were cut for an individual uh, by a dollar, right? Paid less, a uh, dollar less to the government uh, in taxes. So that's uh, another extra dollar of uh, disposable income, right? Well, uh, because the MPC is 0.8, uh, we had a first round, we didn't, that, that full effect of that a dollar did not go in as spending. Uh, it goes through that first uh, round of, of, of people getting those tax cuts um, and they only spend 0.8 of it, right? In this case, the MPC is 0 0.8. So uh, for every dollar of tax cuts, you're actually only getting 0.8 of spending, right? So that's why it makes sense. Uh, you get less bang for your buck, so to speak, from a, from a tax cut versus uh, direct spending. Because all the spending is going into the economy and getting multiplied through that multiplier. Uh, when you do it through tax cuts, um, it goes through and, and not all of it gets spent into the economy uh, because of the MPC is, is less than one in that case. Um, so intuitively, that should make sense. Uh, again, this formula over here is how you do that. Um, and in this case, we have the tax multiplier is four. So we go back. Uh, again, they're asking for what amount of, of tax, in this case, we know it's tax cuts, um, will equate to this $40 billion figure. So we go back uh, before, um, let's call this T, I guess, for, for taxes, um, times four this time is going to equal the $40 billion that we need, right? So taxes are going to be uh, 40 over four. And this is 10, oops, can't quite write it in there, but it's $10 billion, right? Um, and again, that's a tax cut. We know, uh, you know, we wouldn't raise taxes, right, to, to stimulate aggregate demand. That would uh, go the other way uh, with aggregate demand. So we get a, a, a tax cut of, of $10 billion. Um, all right, so I'm gonna need this again. Bear with me while I clear this off. Again, not a crazy difficult question. Um, you do have to kind of remember the formulas there for you know, spending multiplier. And, and I think the tax multiplier one's a little more difficult, but. All right, okay, let's go back. So that was part C. Um, all right, part D, uh, assume instead that the Canadian Central Bank takes actions to restore the economy to full employment output uh, by influencing investment spending. So now we're gonna focus on, on the I component, right, of aggregate demand. Uh, draw a correctly labeled graph of the money market uh, and show the effect of the actions taken by the central bank on the equilibrium interest rate. Okay, so let's go back here. Um, okay, so they tell you essentially what they want to draw here, right? The money market graph. And uh, they give you the clue, um, well, the central bank is trying to uh, enact policies uh, that will stimulate uh, investment demand, right? So uh, we're, again, we're trying to stimulate aggregate demand to close that output gap uh, when we're in a recessionary gap. Um, they want to enact a policy uh, that will increase the I component, right? So think through that logic. Um, 
let's write it over here. So we know uh, the I component we want to increase, right? So, uh, and think about interest rates because uh, central bank really uh, uh, can manipulate things through interest rates, right? So, um, <clears throat> and this I is investment, right? Investment from uh, C plus I plus G plus net exports. Um, so what stimulates investment? Well, um, if interest rates are very high, uh, people are not going to want, you know, companies and, and investors are not going to want to borrow a lot of money uh, to make investments, right? Conversely, if interest rates are very low, uh, they might uh, be more willing to uh, borrow money to make those investments, right? So um, as interest rates go down, this I component goes up uh, and vice versa, right? As uh, interest rates go up, this I component goes down. So we know uh, we want to draw a money market where uh, we are showing that interest rates are decreasing, right? So uh, down here, if you remember, we have a quantity of money. Uh, and up here, um, we have, this is price, right? But the price of money uh, is the nominal, let's just put IR interest rate. Um, and usually we'll denote that um, as uh, lowercase i. Um, okay, so uh, let's do that regular graph here, right? So we have uh, our demand curve. Uh, and if you remember in the, the money market graph, the key thing about this is that the money supply, um, so that's your supply curve, is vertical, right? Oops. Let's call that money supply one. Um, and then we're going to have an intersection here. And uh, let's just call that I sub one, right? So that's our interest rate in the initial case. Um, remember the central bank enacted a policy or they wanted to enact a policy that would uh, over here increase this I component, right? Uh, so we want to show interest rates uh, declining, right? Because a decline in interest rates uh, is going to stimulate some uh, investment demand. So what would they do? We're going to show on our graph. Um, they would enact policies uh, that shift the money supply, right? So uh, over here, um, and then to show that, we would go come across uh, I sub two, right? So uh, uh, you've shown the graph, um, you know, and if you want, you can denote uh, or write down here somewhere, I, you know, uh, here's a uh, decrease uh, in interest rates, and that would stimulate investment demand. Okay, and just make sure, draw a correctly labeled graph. We showed all that. Show the effect of the actions taken by the central bank. Um, and we should show the correct thing, right? You're gonna make sure um, you didn't accidentally increase interest rates because that would be incorrect in this question. All right, so part E. Um, so part E is actually a question from unit six. Um, so I know on the, the 2020 uh, AP exam, it's not gonna be uh, addressed, but I can quickly uh, sort of go through the graphs here um, for those that aren't interested, uh, might be interested or uh, in the future if, if I use this video again. Um, so Canada and Mexico are trading partners. Uh, draw a correctly label graph for the foreign exchange market of the Canadian dollar. So we wanna know the price of the Canadian dollar um, in terms of uh, their trading partner and the, the Mexican peso. So, uh, and they wanna know the effect of uh, what happens on this interest rate uh, change. So the interest rates decreased in part D. Um, so let's go back over here. Uh, let's just go like this and we can kind of do it off to the side. Now there's a couple, uh, uh, two ways that you could show this. Um, ultimately you're showing what happens to the price, right? The exchange rate. Uh, in this case uh, of Canadian dollars. So let's go, let's draw two graphs here. Um, so because we're talking about, so this is gonna be quantity of Canadian dollars. Oops. Canadian dollars. And then up here, we're gonna have the Mexican peso 
in terms of Canadian dollars, right? So that's a price of a currency, uh, what we know as uh, you know an exchange rate, right? So same thing here, peso over Canadian dollars. All right, so um, you know similar to other graphs, we've got. Let's just go ahead and draw these out. An initial equilibrium, and then they're asking about you know what might happen um, because of the interest rate change in illustrated in the above um, graph. So uh, two ways to think about this. Um, the first one would be so I think the key thing here also is I forgot to bring up this. Let's call that. Um, the exchange rate one, right? Again, that's your price. Um, you know, if you want to put quantity down here, you can. Um, so uh, interest rates, right? So interest rates fall. Um, there's going to be less demand uh, for that currency, right? So uh, investors are very interested in, in getting the highest return. Um, you know, if, if uh, uh, your country's interest rate is 100%, something crazy high, you're going to have a ton of investors who are saving money in other countries who are going to want to, uh, you know, put their money in a bank in your country um, and earn 100% interest, right? That's a pretty attractive uh, uh, offer. Um, conversely, interest rates go down, uh, people might pull their money in and find a, a better investment alternative. So, uh, your demand, uh, and this is one way you can show this, right? Demand is going to shift uh, left for uh, Canadian dollars, right? So uh, you have the price over here, uh, price of Canadian dollars in terms of Mexican pesos going down, um, and that is called uh, depreciation, right? So the price is going down, um, and uh, that's one way to think about it. Now there's another way you could think about this, and you you got points on this question. Uh, for drawing either way, so it really didn't matter how you thought through it. Um, and this one makes more sense probably from, from the question we did previously, uh, showing uh, up here that the money supply increased, right? So think about it uh, in terms of, uh, again, we have quantity of Canadian dollars over here. So up here on this graph, we were showing uh, quantity increasing. Uh, so makes sense to, to shift the supply curve of Canadian dollars, right, way over here. And again, we're interested in the price. Um, and these two effects, interestingly, are, are show exactly the same thing. Uh, they show a, a price uh, of Canadian dollars in terms of pesos uh, going down, right? So that's depreciation. Um, and that would explain uh, part E here, right? So draw a correctly labeled graph. Uh, we did that and you only need to do one of those. You didn't have to do both, um, but both were uh, correct. And yep, that was it for question one. All right, so let me stop there. And that's question one from uh, the 2019 uh, macro exam.